do that. <laughs> so we're on record now. Um, so afterwards, um, you can view this again. I will send the link out and also you can share it with your um, friends as well who you think will be interested. Okay, so also there's no screen sharing and this is for everyone's safeguarding. Um, if for any instant, um, any reason there's any inappropriate behaviour, I'm sure there's not because I think I know most of you, um, I will leave, like exit you from the meeting. No questions asked, <laughs> um, just to keep us all safe. Um, okay, um, so that is me at the end of my little spiel. So I'm going to hand over to Alison Miller now, who's going to talk you through our um, reading online offer. Okay, all right. Hello, everybody. I'm really pleased to, to be part of this and be part of the first one. It's quite exciting. This is my first Zoom meeting as well. So um, I'm just getting to grips with all that. So apologies if I make any mistakes. Um, my title is Reader and Culture Development Manager for Leeds Libraries. So I in my opinion, get all the fun stuff to do, but others will disagree with me. Um, so I look after our culture offer across the whole of our central library and 35 branch libraries, and um, also look after the reading, which kind of goes from the basics of making sure that the right books are on the right shelves in the right libraries and buying those books um, to looking after how those books are maintained. But also, very importantly, for where we are now, also our digital reading offer um, and I'm going to take us through that a little bit today. So I'm now going to try and share my screen. So Claire and I practiced this yesterday so we'll, let's just hope that we um, we're okay. Um, trying to look. Is that the one I want to share? For some, re for some reason, is that working, everybody? Are you all right? So you need to go to share screen. I think it was at the bottom. Yes, yes which I'm doing. So, and then it should come up with a, another option. Start broadcasting. Oh yeah, share. Yes. That's what I wanted to do. There we go, folks. <laughs> Um, so I suppose just because I'm aware that I'm the first speaker um, this is just to show you what we have been doing in Leeds libraries. Apologies to all the librarians that are, are part of this call because you, you're obviously very well aware of this because lots of you are working very hard to do this. So since we went into lockdown our staff across the city in their own homes in the safety of their own homes have been working on lots and lots of digital content um, to get as much of our collections and our expertise out there as we can. Um, so there's a whole lot of stuff that is available um, on our library's catalogue website. So we, it, we've made it as simple as we can. So there are these buttons here and behind those buttons are information about the services that we as a library service are doing but also information that we are recommending for you for 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 others. So we have kind of searched the web um, and tried to recommend stuff that we think is good for you um, in those categories. And um, probably the maybe the one that's most relevant to a lot of you might be the children and young people and there is a huge amount of resource behind that button of, of stuff that will help you keep your children amused and educated while we are in this weird position. But I'm going to concentrate on the books and reading um, side because that's what I'm all about. Um, so just a quick click behind that button um, and this will tell tells us everything that we've got available to for you to access at home and that is kind of what we had anyway, to be honest, um, most of this stuff was already there. Some of it was quite a well-kept secret. So in a way, um, lockdown has been quite good for us because people have sought out our digital content and we've certainly seen, a, as we would expect, a massive rise in um, our eBooks and audio, for instance, going out. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about 
what we have on offer um, and just take you on a little bit of a whistle stop tour for that. So on our catalog, I mean, all these are links, but um, traditionally we would go through here and this is our catalog of reading that is available digitally. So this is, um, we use a supplier called BorrowBox. So you'll see the BorrowBox um, logo up here in the corner. These are books that are available to you to download and can be, as long as you're a member of the library, can be downloaded to either a PC through, through this method or through an app on your Apple or Android phone or tablet. So for that, you would need to download the app just like you do any other app on your phone. Obviously those are free you would find Lee's libraries within that app. And once you have done that once and put in your um, library card number and pin number, you can then start downloading books onto your device to read. It works pretty much the same way as a library book does off the shelf. So most of the content that we've got on there is, is one book, one one reader and um, so once you have borrowed it it's not available to anybody else so you would download that onto your app you get it for three weeks in the same way that you would get a library book and you can then read it off your off your device so it's a brilliant way of um of finding of finding stuff to read we also um as soon as we went into lockdown realized obviously realized that this was going to get a lot of use so we have downloaded um we have bought what we have called remote reads so these are books that um can be downloaded by many many people at the same time so rather than the one book one reader where if somebody's reading it you have to then reserve that book. These can be um, read as soon as you see them and downloaded. So it makes it ideal for readers groups and um, discussions with family if you wanted to do that. Um, so I'll go into that a bit later because we, we have also set up a readers group. So but I'm doing a whistle stop tour of, of BorrowBox. We have both on BorrowBox ebooks and e-audio um, so you can depending on your reading preference you can um, download both of those both work in the same way they're downloaded onto your device um, and then you would listen to you would either listen to a book or, or read it on your screen so that's our books um, if i go back to library online we also have um, the lighter reading side of things and hopefully a brilliant way of saving you guys lots of money. Um, I, I definitely am a magazine junkie and we all know how expensive they are. So within, um, again, going through that main app into our RB Digital. So this is the supplier that we use for our digital magazines, digital comics and now digital newspapers. So if I just click into one of those, so I'm clicking into magazines, we buy popular magazines so that you guys don't have to. So these appear on our catalog every month and you can download a copy of Cosmo or BBC Good Food and in exactly the same way that would appear either on your PC or um, you can download the RB Digital app and that will, um, you can read them again on your tablet or phone or wherever you want to do. There's a really good um, thing within the app that means that you can, if you imagine reading a magazine, there's lots of pictures in a magazine. Um, to make it easier, you can opt for a text version. You can switch between the two, so you don't lose the, the beauty of a magazine, which is the pictures. But to make it easier, if you can also click on text and you can read just the text there. So um, and just a quick look at both of those. So um, comics and graphic novels, exactly the same thing. Um, a mixture of content for children and teenagers as well as, as well as adults on there works in exactly the same way as the magazines. 
and then newspapers. This is um, new to Leeds Libraries. We added this again as we went into lockdown. We realised that it was a really valuable resource to let people have. So you can now, again through the RB Digital app or online, look at pretty much all the popular um, newspapers. So you can see here, if I just scroll along, all kind of the big players that you would expect um, to be able to, to read. And again, you can just read those on your, on your machines. So that's, um, that's kind of digital reading, that's newspapers, magazines, comics, I hope pretty much we've got everything covered there um, that you would want. Then I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the benefits of reading and, and how, how we've kind of tried to take that a bit more um, online uh, to, to get the comfort that you get from a, a library readers group and try to take that online. So we have um, recently announced our Leeds Reads book club and using one of those titles um, that I talked about on Borrowbox that can be downloaded by multiple people, we have chosen one of those titles and we are running a book club with it. So we have set a date and a time that um, we can go on Twitter and we can discuss the book and that will actually have a librarian there ready to, to talk about that book. So I would really encourage you to, to have a look at that. Um, I think reading is one of those things that um, we know is, is superb for our well-being. That, that just six minutes of reading a day reduces stress levels by 68%. That's huge. Um, and I think it's, it's something that we can easily forget. And, and I think now is not the time to challenge, I mean, it depends what kind of person you are, but I'm a reader and certainly I don't want um, really heavy stuff at the moment. I kind of want light and fluffy and make me happy books at the moment. You, you may be different. <laughs> Um, but this is it. This is that. It, it's not a really heavy read. It should be a fairly easy read. We've put up some kind of prompts here, so when you're reading the book, you can have a think about um, the sort of things that we might be talking about in our book club. Book club. This page here is our Leeds Reads blog. So this is kind of where we put any information about books and reading um, and also writing. So you can have a, a search of that, but we have a section here, Leeds Reads Book Club, and that just tells you a bit about how that book group is going to work. Um, but the most important thing is the, the date and time here. Um, so we will be discussing that book on Thursday, the 21st of May at 5.30. And it would be great if you could um, have a read of that book and join us, join us then. And I think, I hope that's enough for a whistle stop tour. I seem to have talked for quite a while. So apologies if I've gone over. No, no, that's wonderful. Thank you, Alison. So yeah. Um, free magazines, free ebooks, couldn't get better than that. Um, I'm quite keen to have a little look at the Raspberry Pi one um, for our code club, so maybe we'll get some inspiration out of there. Um, so thank you so much, Alison. Um, do ask any questions in the chat and we can come back to them later on if needed. Um, so now we're going to move on to Natasha, if you're ready, Natasha, um, who's going to talk a little bit more um, about, I think, human skills and networking. Oh, you're on mute, Natasha, I'll take you off. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. yes. Thumbs up. Sweet. Um, so thank you so much to Claire for inviting me along. I'm very, very grateful to be here. I have so much love for the libraries and um, wax lyrical about all of the amazing things that you're doing um, for our wonderful community. Um, so, yeah, I'm Natasha Sosalem and I'm one of the heads of technology at Sky. I, I look after their digital service department. Um, so looking after the customers, all of our amazing customers at Sky. Um, so um, what I wanted to talk to you uh, is a little bit about the sector I work in, which is technology. And one of the things that people 
think about with technology is that it's very techy, uh, that we're coding all of the time, that we're busying away coding, um, that it is um, complicated. And the simple truth is there are probably aspects of technology that are that, but technology in its essence starts and ends with people. We're designing the stuff that we make for people and it's an incredibly people-centric industry to work in. Um, we work in teams, it's a lot about collaboration and actually it's not all of the roles are techie. They're very much uh, led around um, human behavior and around human skills. So I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about what we do in the sector. For those who aren't that familiar with working in tech, um, and tell you a little bit about my career um, and to show that it's very easy for people to sidestep into the industry as well. So um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about is um, developing people's human skills. And so I'll expand a bit on this. So you kind of hear about these things uh, banded about that we have these hard skills and we have these soft skills. And hard skills are these uh, sort of tangible skills like science or maths that can be tested and they can be learnt and um, soft skills are these fluffy skills. They are these um, hard to pin down examples. And what's really fascinating about soft skills is you may think you may be very good at soft skills, but it's actually not your opinion that matters. It's the opinion of whoever you're speaking to, whoever you're engaging with, to whether you're good at your soft skills, because it's, it's them that judges it, if that makes any sense. Um, and I think that, um, you know, one of the, the key things that I hate is the fact that they're called soft because they're anything but soft. They're, they're really hard to learn. Doing public speaking or influencing a negotiation or flexible thinking or empathy, they're not natural skills to a lot of people. Um, and for some reason, we always kind of fixate on this hard skills being kind of king and actually soft skills are what's really, you know, important in every sector, regardless of technology. And that's why, you know, for me, you hear me say calling them human skills or core skills or to call them what I, you know, would say in work, they're business critical skills. And I think that, um, you know, we as a wider society don't value these skills enough. And these are skills, ironically, that females tend to excel at as well, which is why it's so important to get more females and more diversity and inclusion into the tech sector, because these skills are needed. Um, and so let me tell you about these fluffy uh, soft skills that nobody seems to uh, um, uh, prioritize on job descriptions. So things like attitude, you know, you, you probably worked with somebody with a bad attitude and how demoralizing that can be motivation you know somebody who's like come on guys we can do this you know let's get going um influencing skills um being able to try and change the course of um a bad direction and somebody who has the emotional intelligence uh, to be able to influence a decision conflict resolution somebody who isn't going to be hot-headed and who is going to come in and actually try and diffuse a situation and find some middle ground um empathy which is such a big, big thing. They say that the key to innovation is empathy. Um, a lot of um, innovators are saying that now. If you can empathize with something, um, you probably find the issue which you can uh, fix or ameliorate. Um, collaboration, communication, interpersonal skills, problem solving, and creativity. Um, and I think what's really fascinating right now is hands up for those on the video if you think you've got some things that you need to work on on this list. <laughs> hands 100%. up. 100%. Okay. Now keep your hand up if you've got a plan of action of how you are going to address that this year. <laughs> and it's fascinating, isn't it, that we, we know that we've got things to work on on this list. You know, so my first point of advice is think about what you can do on some of these areas. If you know that you're not very good at public speaking, I promise you every single time I do a talk, whether it's on Zoom or face to face, I'm nervous and it, 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 it never goes away. And I think that some people think, well, you know, God, you've done so many talks now, you should be a dab hand at it. 
every, even the most experienced speaker, even Michelle Obama herself will say that she gets nervous. Um, and so, you know, fear becomes your ally and you just effectively find ways of kind of making it work. Um, but there are wonderful videos and tutorials out there. If you think that you're a bit weak in some of these areas, there are some great talks that I would highly recommend. If you want to think about more about an, a positive and emotional, um, empathetic way of communicating, there's a lady called Breen Brown. She does some amazing um, TED Talks that I would highly recommend watching um, around um, some of these other things. You can look at lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com, or LinkedIn Learning. Um, there's, there's a wealth of videos out there, but Ultimately, you guys need to take the first steps on some of this stuff. But what I would say, um, another thing that never gets talked about is vulnerability. And I think when people say the word vulnerability, initially, I think of this, because uh, I'm a techie. And in technology speak, if a system is vulnerable, it's open for attack. It's, uh, it's the door's wide open and somebody's going to attack it or it's going to break. It's seen as weak. And I find that really fascinating because I think vulnerability is a strength. And I'm not going around my teams with, you know, a bag of tissues and crying my heart out every day, but I'm not afraid to show vulnerability. I'm not the smartest person in the room. I am incredibly lucky that I'm surrounded by smart people and I'm okay to admit when I don't understand something. As a leader, I'm very, very happy to do that. Um, I am okay admitting when I get things wrong. We all get things wrong. And it's a funny thing as a leader, I went on a leadership course a very, very long time ago. I'm hoping it, it doesn't still occur that way, where I was taught that as a leader, we should not show weakness. We should not show vulnerability and we should, you know, never apologize. And I wonder if you've ever worked with a boss that was like that, even if they'd made a mistake. And, you know, I'm here saying, you know, that vulnerability is a strength. And it, again, when I talked about the soft skills, by showing vulnerability, you're allowing others to see that it's acceptable and you set the norm. And I think that that is such an important thing to do is by strength in numbers, if you all show that vulnerability and openness is uh, acceptable and not only acceptable embrace, then others will follow suit. And it becomes like this beautiful, uh, positive virus uh, to use an oxymoron um, that um, can only make things a nicer place to work. And the fascinating thing is about soft skills is I can count on one hand the number of people that I haven't been able to promote because they weren't the smartest person in the room or that they didn't have the right hard skills. And I'm not going to lie, there's, there's been that time where I've gone, do you know what, you need to work much more on your theory on something or your breadth of knowledge of uh, the technology isn't where it needs to be. But I can pretty much say 90% of the time, the reason I can't promote people is because of their lack of soft skills. And it is, it is that I do not think that they would handle stepping up because of their lack of awareness around stakeholders and how you have to communicate to different types of stakeholders around their communication methods, realizing that uh, communication methods differ for people. Some people love emails. Some people love face-to-face. -face. I mean, Claire uh, is a texter. I'm a much more of a pick up the telephone type of person. I hate texts. If I, if I genuinely, room 101, I would send text messages because for me, I'm like a sunshine yellow, if you believe in your color thing. And I love speaking to people on the telephone uh, while texting. I think I've, I've got uh, piano thumbs and I just, it winds me up and I, I can't be as verbose as I want to be on text because it annoys me too much. Um, but that is about finding people's different communication methods. Um, and when you struggle with stakeholders, think about how you're communicating to them. So you'll find when I'm communicating to my team of 80, I will do a combination of Slack messages, which are sort of um, IM messages uh, online. I will do face-to-face. -face. I will do a lot of communication that way. I'll do some stuff in email. I might do some stuff in a presentation because the email not, might not have as much context. But don't think a one-size-fits-all with comms. 
um, because people take in information in different ways. So figure out how people want to do that and ask them as well. Um, but going back to my point about promotions, don't think that your loyalty with a company means that you deserve a promotion. And I can, you probably again worked with people who have got a promotion and you think, how the hell did they get that promotion? Um, and don't confuse the two because you, you know, your loyalty to a company is great, but it doesn't mean that you are necessarily going to get promoted. So my advice to you is that a lack of focusing on your soft skills or human skills or core skills is absolutely hindering you progressing further in your career. Me as a leader, um, the skills that I use most are my human skills. The fact that I have a good awareness of the infrastructure and stuff is really important, but nine times out of 10, the stuff I'm doing is working with people. And that is what most leaders do. You look at prime ministers, you look at CEOs, the skills that they use most are the skills I showed on that matrix screen earlier. Um, so, you know, right now, if you want to progress in your career, think of an action plan. You saw how many hands went down when people said, well, I haven't got an action plan for developing it. You know, you should. And, you know, we talked about managers a few times. And the thing is that it's really fascinating. I've left jobs because it was a great place to work, but I could not stand the managers that I was working with. And it's a fascinating thing. One of the most hardest decisions that I make and one of the most important decisions I make is who becomes a manager and specifically a line manager. Um, because it is a very important decision that I don't take lightly. Um, and when you are putting people into management, number one is we don't give people enough support mechanisms in place. So again, you know, a brand new manager who hasn't had training on how to people manage, how to get the best out of their employees is going to fail. Um, and so if you are in a position where you are able to uh, influence who becomes a manager, number one, give them training so that they can succeed. But to be very mindful of this as well, because people leave bad managers, people don't tend to leave bad companies. You want a manager who will teach you, who will inspire you, who will motivate you, who will mentor you. Um, a great manager who will effectively see things that you don't see in yourself, challenge you in different directions that you don't see in yourself. And I'm not going to say that everybody's going to always have a brilliant manager. And if you struggle with that, then reach out wider and get a mentor. Um, and don't just be limited, you know, that... Oh, I'm not learning much from my manager. Okay, cool. That's crap. I'm sorry for you. But roll up your sleeves and go, right, what can I do now? I can get a great mentor who can teach me some of this stuff. Um, just because one door's shut doesn't mean that they're all shut. And I'm a very tenacious person, as a few of you who know me are. And uh, it, I'll talk a bit about my empowering women with tech stuff. But I've got a lady from Google in Silicon Valley dialing into one of my events at the end of the month just because I was tenacious and asked her to do it. Um, and I've had some incredible speakers who, because of just the power of asking and tenacity and going, well, look, you know, this still doesn't work for me. I'm going to open another one. Um, I think we're, we're too easy sometimes to throw in the towel. And uh, I just have a smile on my face and go, right, okay next what can I try now <laughs> um, so this is interesting a few people have heard me talk about this before but project Aristotle was a project that Google ran and what Google wanted to look at was uh, what is the recipe to a brilliant team what you know what makes a team excellent what makes a team excel and what was fascinating is they found quite a few obvious things around communication, but one thing came around from uh, them, which was around this thing called psychological safety. And what they said was, uh, there is psychological safety and psychological danger. And in psychological danger, you create this sort of common knowledge effect where you have this fear of admitting mistakes, blaming others, then because people are scared of admitting things, they're less likely to share different views. And this creates this common knowledge effect. And you started to see it at big companies that failed like Lehman Brothers, that there was this sort of psychological danger. And Google said, look, for the best teams to succeed, we needed psychological safety. And going back to that point I made about openness and vulnerability, 
we're comfortable admitting mistakes. That's life. You know, things go wrong. But, you know, my expression on this is I, I look at, I don't look at failure as a bad thing. In the tech sector, we don't. But I see it as two things. I win, hurrah. Or I learn, hurrah. You know, right now, that's, you should never look at it negatively. Um, I learn and I will try not to make the same um, mistake again. But ultimately, I'm still winning because I've learned something. So I'm comfortable admitting mistakes. I'm comfortable learning from failure. Um, Everyone openly shares ideas, and then we have a better innovation in decision making. And Google said, look, if people do this, this makes a great team. So if you work in a team, um, think about what elements you could do to make things a bit more psychologically safe, because it will make it a love, much happier place to work. But you'll, you'll probably get amazing ideas out of it. And it goes back to that openness and vulnerability side of things. People are almost scared to admit when they've done something wrong or when they failed. And it's, I suppose, comes from the way we're educated and uh, the way we're brought up. But the older you get, the, the more you realize that you, you, you're just learning. Um, I'm renovating my house at the moment and I'm constantly uh, learning how not to do things. Um, and you just kind of smile and go, well, you know, that's a bit of a shocker. You know, I wish I'd have known that before I stripped that wall down, that that's going to cost us so much to replace. Um, well, I've learned a valuable lesson there. <laughs> um, and so, um, sorry, I haven't, I had no time to practice these slides. So I hope this is kind of going across okay. I haven't touched these slides in a very long time. So, um, um, one of the things which is fascinating about psychological safety is around, um, finding different mechanisms to create psychological safety. So one of the things that I used to do at the BBC is we used to have quite a lot of um, junior developers that would come in who um, would think they're God's gift to coding and would see something broken at let's say 11 o'clock at night when we're all off offline and fix it and try and fix it. And then we're trying to do a good thing. Um, but because they're quite junior, they didn't realize that, you know, how, this little thing they're fixing, fix, you know, interdepends with all these things back here. And then they would break something. And we'd usually find out uh, first thing in the morning when something broke, we'd all be called out of bed at about four or five in the morning. And uh, in one case, the developer had uh, unfortunately fallen ill, so we couldn't even get in touch with the developer to figure out what on earth he'd done. Um, and so what we did is we created the blame cake. And so we effectively just said to the people, look, don't take it out on that poor person. They probably feel really bad right now. They were trying to help. And, you know, you don't want to crush people's morale. We will talk to them about the better way of doing it because uh, the heart was in the right place. But uh, what we'll do is nobody mentions it. Nobody has a go at them, um, but they're going to bake a cake for us. And not a shop bought cake. Uh, they have to just bake a cake and then, uh, it's their nice way of, you know, giving something back to the team when their team had their back um, on this. And um, I can pretty much tell you I've eaten some truly horrific cakes in my time. Uh, so uh, that was a, a monstrosity. Um, and so I will end on this first part on culture. You have to always start with culture first. No strategy around getting more females into your workplace um, or diversity into the workplace will work if the culture is wrong and doesn't allow it to flourish. So think about some of the things I mentioned about openness, about vulnerability, about psychological safety, around, you know, working with your colleagues to think of a strategy around getting more human skills or soft skills training into your workplaces. And if you are working for yourself or thinking of a career direction, think about what you can do to invest in yourself when you know that these skills these human skills are the ones that are going to matter most. So secondly, I was going to talk a little bit about my journey. I think I've had a pretty much a choose your own adventure sort of journey. I don't know if any of you read those books back in the day. Um, and uh, you would be able to kind of read up to a point and then you'd have two choices at the bottom and it would tell you to go to page six if you choose option A or go to page 12. And then you go to page 12 and then your character dies. So you'd be like, no, I never meant page 12. I meant page six. So you can keep the book going. 
Um, if you've never used, read them, there were, there were loads of fun when I was a youngster. Um, and the thing is, I have had the most unusual kind of career path. Um, and I started off as a music photographer. Uh, so I uh, got to take shots of bands like Muse and David Bowie and Pulp and Prodigy. Um, I actually got to know uh, this, the band Muse pretty well. Um, so uh, that's Matt and that's um, his wonderful guitar uh, that I got. And then my husband uh, hated this guitar, so he uh, made me uh, sell it a couple of years ago for 500 pounds, um, uh, which he felt was quite good because uh, it didn't cost me anything. And I used to always joke and say, look, if it ended up on Antiques Roadshow, I, I would absolutely throttle you, Dave. Uh, but it actually ended up on uh, eBay and sold for 13 and a half thousand. Actually, since that has um, been, uh, since I did these slides, it actually resold again in Los Angeles for nineteen thousand pounds. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I got a nice ring out of it. I think the other half uh, felt a bit of guilt, but uh, <laughs> so uh, I used to be a photographer with a nice guitar, um, and then I worked in film and television. And what I found was working in film and television on things like Emmerdale, the way we worked in film and TV is exactly the same as we work in digital. We work in little teams. Each person in the team has a different role. So in coding, uh, sorry, in tech, we have coders, developers, testers, uh, the product owner, who's sort of the Steve Jobs, the visionary. Um, and the same thing working in TV, we've got uh, cameramen, sound engineers, prop men and women, uh, art department, makeup, and we all have our roles and responsibilities. We'd have a number of scenes we need to shoot within a two week block. Um, we'd pivot if we couldn't shoot for some reason. And this is the same in tech. We have a two week block and we'll try and do as much work in that two week block. Um, and what you find is that we have so many transferable skills between one and the other. Uh, so uh, moving into tech is what my point being wasn't the bigger leap um, because there's so many skills that are transferable. Um, and so these are just a few of the things that I have done over the years. I've been a marketing manager. I've worked in film and TV. I've worked for the government, working in science and innovation. I was a software developer for a bit, an SEO advisor. Um, I worked at the BBC as a delivery manager. Um, I'm head of technology at Sky for the digital service department. Oh, I've forgotten one, sorry. And I'm a certified badass as well. Um, and... Um, I don't know if you can see in the top right thing, I have a Henry the Hoover icon. And my point there is, I have the most choose your own adventure career path. But in each of these roles, I've just been hoovering up experience, hoovering up soft skills, human skills experience that I use in my job day to day now. So don't be worried that your CV isn't, you know, clean and linear in one direction because it's all about that human skills experience that and how much of this, the stuff you've learned is transferable um, and don't be scared about that with job descriptions as well a job description is a suggestion it is a suggestion at that moment in time this is the sort of thing I'm looking for I can say hand on heart most of the jobs I've gone for I probably end up only doing about 60% of what was in that original job description. Because when I go into the role, 40% will mold against my experience, my skill sets, you know, the uh, specific set of skills I bring in a sort of Liam Neeson taken style uh, thing. And uh, I've been victim of it, of psyching myself out for going for something because I don't think I tick everything on the job description. But you have to remember the job description is a suggestion. Um, and so, you know, the image on the right, I want to kind of make the point of don't compare yourself to other cars. You are a unique person. And I think it is, I'm not suggesting that, you know, other people are clapped out bangers, but um, what I am saying to you is don't keep comparing yourself to other people because each of us is unique. And I think it's easy to go, oh, you know, I'm not like that person. That person's a much better person in the sector or in the industry. And I'm like, well, no, because I have a lot of unique things that that person doesn't have. Um, and my second point is a little bit about snakes and ladders. The game of snakes and ladders, traditionally, the thing is about, you know, you win by climbing up ladders and you lose by falling down snakes. 
in my career path, actually falling down a few snakes has been a lot of fun and actually giving me an opportunity to try something new. So don't see taking a few steps back as something negative because it probably will open the door to a few new ladders that go a lot higher or into a lot more adventures than you would have done if you'd have just played the game how you would have normally should have been. Um, and so for me, I've taken loads of steps back. I've taken loads of different career directions and you know what, it's been a lot of fun. Um, and it's better than doing everything linear in my opinion. So, you know, remember this, you're hiring talented people, not a job description. Your job description is not going to do any work for you. Do not look at defining people for great jobs. Look at defining jobs for great people. See past the job description, see all of the amazing interpersonal skills, human skills that somebody could bring to a role and look past their CV. Um, because you'll find loads of diamonds in the rough like me. Um, and so if you've been inspired by some of the stuff that I've talked about, um, there are some really great ways of getting into tech. So Sky has this wonderful scheme called Get Into Tech, which is an absolutely free three month coding course for women um, in Leeds, uh, Scotland and in London. Um, it gives them, it's free and it's run usually in the evenings um, and gives you basic coding skills um it's done in a really nurturing um positive way and at the end of it if it's not for you that's cool um but of the people who've done it um one in four of those women now work at sky in software engineering and quite a number of them have gone on to other areas like nhs digital to name but a few um we also have our women in tech scholars which is five women um who pitched ideas for great things that they want to develop. Um, and they're from all over the country. These five women uh, won a 25,000 pound bursary plus a year's worth of mentoring with Sky to develop their ideas. So one of the ladies there has got a great game for children to get children to talk more about mental health. Another lady uh, after losing her child at a fair, um, created i think called a gator watch which is a way of um, being able to quickly track down a child using um sort of rfid software i think there's another lady there who's a, a farmer and she's looking at agritech um ideas because there's a lot of um poaching happening at the moment so wildly different ideas um and so uh, they run every year as well so you might want to check that out too um and so i kind of end with some of the stuff that I love doing as well as work. So my other half um, works as a designer and I realized quite um, late in the game that he wasn't really into promotions because he really loves what he does. And, um, and I'd be like, well, you know, you need to climb up the ladder. And he'd be like, look, I don't really want to because the things that join, you know, I'd have to do, I don't really want to do. Um, and I realized that he had such a valuable point. And um, when you gain a promotion, it's brilliant because you gain more responsibility, probably hopefully get some more money uh, and you challenge. But what's really fascinating is every time you do a jump, it probably takes you away one step from the thing that got you into the industry in the first place. Um, I loved working in delivery. I loved being on the shop floor, kind of delivering stuff um from the start to the finish and now i have wonderful teams that do that for me um and so i really liked the idea of trying to figure out ways of giving back but also pushing myself a bit out of my comfort zone again so um i started to think about this whole thing around growth mindset and fixed mindset so i don't know if any of you are familiar with growth and fixed mindset so fixed mindset it's very common in females actually. And so the statement, I can either do it or I can't. I tried it once, didn't work, it's not for me. Um, when I'm frustrated, I give up. Um, and it, the, I tried it once and I'm, I'm not gonna try it again, seems to be one of the statements that tends to resonate. And I don't know why there's some really interesting studies about it, um, but, Fixed mindset is a very limited mindset. And I came across it a lot where females um, will go, look, I, I gave it a try, it's not for me. And I, the growth mindset is such a great way of looking at it. 
and it goes back to that whole I win or I learn statement. Um, failure is an opportunity to grow. Um, feedback's constructive. I mean, how many of you have had a PDP or a, a meeting with a boss and they've given you nine pieces of lovely feedback and one piece of maybe constructive feedback? How many of you remember the nine and how many of you do remember that one thing? And, um, you know, I'm not going to say I'm great always at this, but I try and find feedback constructive. I'm inspired by the success of others. I love watching what others are doing and following in their footsteps and being inspired by them. And I love to try new things. So embracing this growth mindset, I started to push myself out of my comfort zone, uh, kind of almost in the Jim Carrey, yes man style thing, if you've ever seen that film. So I um, started public speaking more. For ages, I did not want to do any public speaking because I felt in my mind, you had to be an uber expert to speak and that I'd be caught out as some phony or some imposter on the stage, daring to utter an opinion on something. Um, and for ages I didn't speak because I, I didn't think I had anything valuable to say. And I realized very late on that we need speakers of all abilities and of all backgrounds and all skills levels because everybody is a role model to somebody. Um, so if you are, on your first steps into something, or if you're mid-level, or if you're a senior, or if you're a leader, there's always somebody who wants to know how you've done it because they're a few steps behind you. And that's cool. I um, did uh, set up Ladies of Code in Leeds, which I haven't done for ages, I need to dust it off, but it was a way of getting more female software engineers um, to go to events and to speak. I curated the tech events at the Leeds International Festivals for a couple of years. I have never curated events at a festival before and they got in touch and said, would you like to do it? And I said, yeah, that sounds great. That's, that's a lot of fun. Not realizing how much work it is to set events up. Um, so I curated some like 12 events um, within a three month period, which nearly broke me whilst also working and having kids. Um, I, one of my events, I microchipped these wonderful people in the bottom middle column as they all have an RFID chip in there, which they can program up so they can put their Oyster card on it. They can put their flat fob on it. They can start a car with it. They, uh, um, so uh, that was fun to try and find a person to do that in Leeds. Um, I also did an event on sex robots uh, because a lot of the stuff around sex robots is quite a lot of sensationalism in your papers like the Daily Express. Um, and, I, and I wanted to create a wider debate around it, around loneliness and intimacy and topics which we tend to not want to approach and I really wanted to with an aging population. So I did this event on sex robots um, and quite a lot of my friends knew I was doing an event on sex robots. So if they saw something about sexy robots in the press, they would tag me on Facebook, to which my poor parents kept seeing me being tagged in stories about sex robots and had to give me a call to ask if there was something wrong with my relationship. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was fun. Um, and I didn't let anything limit me. I have two beautiful girls. And when I had my second girl, um, I didn't want to miss out on things. And I, I thought, well, you know, why on earth can I not take my daughter to things? Um, I realized that some of the rules that I thought I had in my head about this stuff, they aren't written down rules. They don't really exist. And it takes somebody and it takes a number of us to break the rules because it's a glass ceiling that has been put in there uh, by probably ourselves. So I would go to my events and I'd bring my daughter along. Um, I, on the left, had a Ladies of the Code event where me and my husband um, messed up on childcare um, and had my daughter with me. And you know what? The world didn't stop spinning that I presented at the talk with my daughter in my arms. Um, she incredibly was amazing. Um, I, I don't think I'd be saying this story if she'd been wailing all the way through it, but she loved it. It's probably a great sensory experience for her. Um, the only hilarious thing was I was kind of making a very serious point and Georgia must have done something really cute because I could just see the whole crowd go, oh, <laughs> which was rather funny to watch. Um, so yeah, 
you know, for any parents or carers on the line, don't let any of these things limit you. You know, I, I made most of my events child friendly. Uh, we, we tend to have guide groups come along to some of them. Um, so don't let, don't hold yourself back on some of these things because it's probably yourself holding them back and be a rule breaker and uh, ask for forgiveness rather than for permission. Um, and so I ended up um, looking around me and going, look, how can I get more females into the sector? Um, and I was really inspired by some stories that my friends had told me about um, Ali McBeal. And then a few of you might remember Ali McBeal. If you haven't, it's on, I think, Amazon Prime or Netflix right now. And it was a lovely show in the 90s um, about a female solicitor or a lawyer. Um, and she used to dance to an imaginary baby. Nobody knows why. Um, but a lot of my friends um, got into law because of Ali McBeal because they saw this amazing character, waltz and all, on TV every week. Um, and you didn't just see all the scenes in court, you saw the paperwork, you saw actually genuinely what it was like to do that role and to see a female in that role. And what crucially is you can't be what you can't see, especially when you don't know about what these roles are. And I could name you tons of roles in the tech sector from scrum master to a solutions architect, to uh, uh, yeah, optimization analyst. And a number of you might go, I, I wouldn't even have the foggiest what these roles do. And so why I'm doing this talk is I have a job to be a storyteller and to share my um, experiences and how much fun I have working in tech to inspire hopefully a few of you to follow in my footsteps. Um, and we need more storytellers, whether that be in libraries, whether that be in marketing, whatever sector it is, you know, I would implore you all to think about being a storyteller and sharing your journey and sharing your work. Don't let anyone else tell your story for you because uh, you'll tell it better than anyone else. Um, and so I decided to set up a network called Empowering Women with Tech to be this beautiful stage of inspiring men, women, and they, telling us a little bit about what they do um, so that we all learn from it. And I didn't want it to be uh, patronizing because we have a lot of these things of, you know, putting women on a pedestal and, you know, um, why aren't there more women in sectors? And I get interviewed a lot about being a woman in tech. And I, uh, and I used to answer a lot of this stuff, but now I find it really hard to do it because I don't want to be known as a woman in tech. I just want to be known as a technologist who happens to be a woman. And I want to talk about the work that I do as a technologist. I don't want to be treated differently. And that's why my events are all about sharing what people are doing or sharing how they got there, but not to, for it to be that we are somehow unique or a disadvantage or... Uh, need pity it is much more about we are badass and you're going to hear what our badass work that we're doing right now um, and so I founded Empowering Women with Tech um, we started small we just did a conference for 375 people <sighs> I've never done anything like this before and Claire and Rachel and others who were at the first one can tell you it was great but bloody stressful um, and um, off the back of that, I founded a mentoring scheme. So um, we have about 120 now women in the mentoring scheme who are mentored by men, women and they in the region. Um, we've just actually got a new cohort in. So if people are interested in getting a mentor or becoming a mentor, uh, get in touch with Clara and she'll forward you my way. Um, and um, uh, so uh, I'm going to end with just saying to people, take a leap, whether you've been inspired by any bit of this talk, um, take a leap, invest in yourself on the soft skills training, um, say yes to more things and get yourself a bit out of your comfort zone, because what's the worst that can happen? Um, and um, please come along to one of our Empowering Women of Tech events. It's open to everyone. It's open to all skills. We've got two amazing events this month. Um, all about um, social inclusion um, and why um, Olu thinks the internet is broken for ethics. And also all about learning about conversational design. How does Google Home work? How does Alexa work? And learning a little bit more about how voice assistants and all of that great stuff uh, happens at Google. 
Um, so again, thank you so much to Claire for uh, inviting me along and thank you so much to all of you for giving up your lunch break to hear me ramble. And I'm on Twitter as unharmonic. Um, uh, so, and I'll, I'll answer any questions if there are any questions. I haven't looked at the chat window, but thank you very much. Oh, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Natasha. You're so inspiring. Um, and yeah, really empowering to everyone to know that we all have those skills. Um, obviously some of them we do need to work on a little bit. Um, Look but yeah, absolutely amazing. I've got a question, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. I've got a bit behind time, but it's absolutely fine. Um, gonna, so we've got a question from Rachel Fox um, about sending the links out afterwards. And yes, um, I can collate them and send them on through email to you all. Um, and then Jen and Lorcan um, is interested in what advice you would give Natasha in to be a good mentor. Listening, listening. I think the key thing is don't go in with any pre um, pre-med thoughts on some of this stuff. When I mentor people, I've got three people I mentor. Um, and a lot of the time it is listening to them to understand what they're getting at. And with my experience actually going, do you know what? One of them is a, a software developer. She's a female software developer. And um, I kind of said to her, one of the best things that I could say to her is to put herself in delivery training because she was struggling really hard with uh, doing estimates and delivery people being quite unreasonable with her. And I said, a lot of the time you have to kind of take the emotions out of it and realize why they are doing things. People don't tend to do things to be dicks. They tend to be doing things either because their boss has told them to do it or because they need that stuff. Um, and so if you have a lot more empathy to why they're asking you to do things, you'll probably understand a little bit more about it and find hopefully some negotiation point for a middle ground. Mm -hmm. um, and it's exactly what she did. And then she totally got a bit more about why they did things a certain way. Mm -hmm. and, and I would have only have got that from listening and having an outsider's perspective on things. Um, you, when you're looking for a mentor if it's to answer it a different way you've got to figure out what you want out of it um, and I think you really need to be clear on what you want out of it if you want uh, to understand a bit more about sector or if it's a, a little bit more about um, to help you through something you're going through at work or if it's to mentor you in a different uh, direction I think that you get the best out of mentor when you're really clear on what you want out of it I think otherwise your poor mentor will be trying to point you in a direction you're going well no that's actually not something I, I care about right now um so I, I think um you should have a bit of a shopping list on what you want out of the situation um and that helps me for example with empowering women with tech to pair you with the right person um or pair you with somebody who will hopefully point you in the direction you're looking for at that moment in time and so that's why naturally maybe mentorships fizzle because you get the most out of your mentor at some point and then you go actually now I want to look at something else here um, and you might need a different mentor for that and that's cool um, but mentoring is a two-way street as a mentor I, I, I learn so much from my mentees as well um, of actually thinking about how I approach things with some of my team um, hearing about some of the challenges my mentees have um, about you know comms so sometimes I speak in a, a tone which is a bit more sky or a bit more uh, senior. And I realise that sometimes some more junior members of my team don't understand that context. So mm -hmm. I've learned so much about my communication style to make sure that everybody understands when I'm giving updates. So it's a two-way street with mentoring as well. That's fabulous advice. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's all the questions we've had. Um, is everyone okay with a bit of a uh, screenshot of the talk and then we'll finish off? Is that all right? So get your poses ready and I will try and remember how to do this on an iPad. I'm a Samsung girl. Okay, one, two, three. Yes, nice one. Thank you, lovely. So thank you so much, Natasha. Thank you, Alison. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today. Um, it's been really, really inspiring and empowering. Um, so a big round of applause, thank you. Um, please have a look on our Facebook page for our next event, 
which is with Lucy Moore from Leeds Museums and Galleries, and she's talking about gender bias in Wikipedia. Um, so that'll be really interesting. And then also we've got the British Library the week after that talking about their Discovering Children book site with Rachel, who's on the call as well, talking about books. So thank you and have a lovely rest of the day. Bye-bye.